All right. Um, so, hello. Hi. Um, thanks for being here and listening to me. Um, we're going to be talking about a, a paper that I wrote that sort of came out of the development of something that I'm working on right now called Constellation. And the whole goal here is that it's actually a, a way of modeling distributed systems, although specifically uh, blockchain technology, um, that can, uh, can allow for us to create and produce uh, interfaces or high level interfaces for low level protocol. So, a little bit of background about me. Uh, I'm why I founded this company, Constellation, which actually has some of the stuff we're going to see today. And uh, I'm a data engineer, so I've, most of my expertise is sort of half distributed systems and half of machine learning space. So, since uh, the main sort of like topic of how this is actually applied is in the blockchain space, I just want to give a quick overview. Um, the, the basic gist of what a blockchain protocol tries to do is create a uh, tangible proof of blockchain. So, what that means is that uh, on a transactional basis, if anyone interacts with the system, then we have a you know, blog of that that is protected by cryptographic key signatures. So something that's really difficult to forge. Uh, and there's an economic incentive for uh, keeping a protocol up and uh, you know, adding more difficulty to uh, forging some sort of previous state. So, and as we've sort of uh, developed uh, new types of applications, uh, people have come up with something called like a smart contract platform, um, which can be really summed up as the notion of decentralized code execution. Verification or validation, rather, of arbitrary data. Um, so there's some specifics there, but the, the main idea here is that a consensus protocol orchestrates all of this, and there's an economic incentive for people to um, keep nodes up, and you know, um, this whole process sort of keeps the whole system fair. However, like in the last few years, uh, there's been a lot of issues with actually applying uh, blockchain technology to uh, you know specific well, to more general use cases, like things uh, that we would expect from like a consumer or enterprise grade in the back end. Um, there are solutions to some use cases, however, they tend to lack in interoperability and most specifically scalability. Um, and in general, also uh, the ability to verify uh, code execution it has a uh, limitation. Uh, it's known in the space as the oracleization problem, but it, it really boils down to how can we allow for these protocols to interact with the data because uh, one of the approaches um, to actually <coughs> notarizing real world information in the smart contract relies on something called a relay. And, and that essentially gives up any kind of like end to end security about the transfer of data from the actual producer to you know, the chain or whoever it connects with. So there has been some advancements in the last few years uh, that we, oh, bummer. So it looks like I have a GIF right there, but it looks like it didn't quite. I'm out in the PDF, but that right there is um, that's a DAG or directly basically graph of different blocks. So you can think about that as multiple different blockchains uh, operating in parallel, and, and that's actually from my my protocol that I built. So you're able to see that too. There's lots of fun visualizations and our UI and stuff too. But in general, um, the next sort of like the iteration of these protocols is uh, we, we call them nonlinear, and I think it's sort of starting to become a more industry term. But the whole idea is that um, they're typically called DAGs, and they uh, process blocks in parallel. So responsibilities across the network uh, are federated by a consensus protocol in the same way that making sure that the uh, you know, arbitrary code execution or you know, that there's, uh, uh, we're actually keeping track of valid data is sort of tied in. So just sort of a new layer that adds scalability to the whole process. So now that we've had a little bit of background on you know, where we are with the actual main use case of, of this model, I wanted to talk about why like, we even care about uh, high-level models for protocols or big data tools, especially this term called like, MapReduce interface. So the history of like, big data really came from sort of an experiment that was run in some you know, server center at Google like 10 or so years ago, and it turned into the MapReduce quite bigger. However, uh, at that time, it was still a very primitive idea, and, and the whole thing was uh, orchestrated around how can I, uh, or an individual who's trying to process or create a, a massively parallel operation on uh, seemingly somewhat structured data, or at least uh, some type of a primitive, like an uh, integer or float, how can I actually uh, solve like a data locality problem? And in this case, uh, what that means would be where do I store my data in like a cluster for cluster computing in such a way that I can perform the minimal amount of uh, operations that send information over the network because that is the uh, most costly and expensive kind of operation when you're dealing with distributed computing, uh, at least in terms of like crunching numbers. 
So what you can see right here is sort of, uh, you know, what actually needed to happen from an explicit, like, programmer standpoint. Like, there was data stored in a certain node over here. Uh, that was, you know, the output of some kind of map cast. And then in order to actually perform, like, a, a correct shuffle, or which is what it's called to do, like, a join merge together data with similar views and properties, you'd actually have to handle um, this shuffling over the network. Um, to some degree yourself, there were very limited tools uh, or thing, technologies you could use to handle that sort of under the hood. And the whole process was very clunky and very, very fragile. So these systems tended to break and just sneeze around them. So the, the real kind of like, you know, next, uh, the real scalability element actually, I, I would say about MapReduce was what it did for application developers. It really it was a lot allowed us and, and folks who wanted to integrate these types of massively parallel operations with uh, highly available you know, backends for consumer and you know, type applications to define these operations in sort of a declarative and uh, somewhat what we call a lazily operated way, which means that I can define that the correct output of an operation should be of a certain type. And when you get you know, the data from a previous operation, then do it as I've already declared. So it gives us the benefit of type checking, the actual uh, you know, expected um, the expected outcome of our code. And it also allowed us to not have to worry about that data locality. So that's kind of like the advent of a lot of the big data tools, which I'm sure you guys have heard of, like uh, Spark, which is a really big one. Um, and, and some of the things that came after it, like cascading or stalling. So since we know it's worked before, and uh, this isn't just me, this is also kind of like a uh, industry, um, at least in the blockchain space, an industry opinion, uh, mainly also too, but from two huge uh, contributors, Joseph Kuhn and Vitalik Buterin, who some of their technology we actually analyzed with this model later, um, that in order to actually have wide adoption of blockchain technology, we need to make some of the advancements that happen organically in the big data space. So there are multiple projects out there trying to tackle this, myself included, but you know, the real goal here is trying to find a high-level API that allows application developers to get access to the utility of one of these blockchains. So, and we're going to talk about an example now about uh, from a successful um, MapReduce type uh, uh, framework called, uh, it was originally called Graph Lab, then it became Dago, and it was just acquired by Apple about a year ago. And their advancement was modeling their entire system in terms of graph operations or distributed graph processing. And uh, the real sort of aha moment that came, you know, that well, I guess maybe they thought of this beforehand. I'm not really totally sure of, of the history, but the thing that unified a lot of these different operations where they were trying to solve a graph, uh, graph theoretic problem, where you can find a more general solution for a little API to any of these uh, you know, sort of massively parallel operations, was uh, describing them in terms of a functoral morphism or operation, which sounds scarier than it actually is. So a functor is sort of is the category theoretic representation of something that you guys might have heard of if you've ever used React before, um, something called like a uh, monad, also to is essentially the same thing. What I mean by that is the output of a function can be described as either the thing you'd expect or just not the thing you'd expect. So in the case of an option, you have a, it's really just a collection that can either contain a thing or nothing. And it allows us to actually verify the the correctness of our code at compile time. And that's sort of like a really important thing too if you're, if you're in the functional programming or in this reactive space. So I'm not gonna go down a pitch for why you should love types because I think that's something that everyone who tries types will tell you, but it's a, it's a real benefit and it makes life easier for programming. And it also has a really cool correlation too uh, from that category theoretic connection, which is that functions are proofs. So uh, that's on another slide, but you'll see in a second that that actually allows us to develop a one-to-one -one correspondence to analytical or algebraic models of our systems and how we program. So specifically speaking, this is our validation monad, or rather it's a, it's a monad, which is also a functor. Um, so functor is sort of the most generic term. And what we've actually done is just wrap the, the general scala future with some expected declared behavior. So if I get a data of a certain type, a, then I want to pass it through a validation pipeline that will inspect, based upon the type of A, how it needs to validate it. So in terms of actually trying to implement these things from an imperative perspective, there's a ton of different issues that one might have in terms of like state. And, and keeping track of state, especially in a distributed system, is incredibly terrible. Um, 
it's incredibly hard in case anybody's ever made a deal with that. Um, it's really, that's really kind of also where the approach of uh, why functional programming got really huge using distributed systems because it allows us to have this kind of declarative approach at the uh, correct behavior of our systems. So functions of proofs, yay. Uh, and there's a ton of stuff out there on this as well, including programming guides. If you guys want to get into functional programming as well, I can recommend to you. So uh, a lot of this behavior comes from a property of homotopy type theory or, or type theories in uh, programming languages, which is we can define similarity across types using tools such as something called uh, covariance or contravariance. So that has a direct correlation in math, especially calculus, in terms of uh, something called like a differential pullback or dealing with uh, tensor operations. We don't need to go. But there, this correlation really allows us to say, hey, if I have a type A and I know that I have two other types that are like, you know, of the same, you know, child relationship to type A, then I can have a method operate on those same types um, with the same behavior and I can reason about it the same way, giving the same guarantees. So an actual example of this would be like, let's say I have a drink or a beverage type, then there's two child types. One is like a soft drink or one is a juice. These are both clearly drinks. But in their own specific like case, we might want to differentiate a soft drink from a juice. Let's say that we're trying to operate a function that takes type soft drink as type type juice. Then we know that a, a function that takes type soft drink could also take cold or tonic water, but it wouldn't necessarily have the relationship with type juice um, that, that we would expect if we were dealing with drink. So it can get a little convoluted, and there's also another notion of contravariance, which gets around that, but it's not necessarily uh, paramount for the conversation today. So these type systems are really helpful for many different things, but one really cool application is the ability for us to implicitly define interoperability between some type of another type. So what I mean by that, is in an actual explicit use case, which is gonna get into how this really ties everything together, is APIs can be described by an algebra or some type of a uh, actual like declared mathematical property, like given a certain type and a certain whatever parameter, I can return the same one and I can treat that as an actual algebraic object. So this is this is like canon. It's a really important thing in functional programming. And it actually is something that really allows us to develop really complex behavior with only a simple small amount of code. So what we're about to see here is how from a programmer's perspective, all we would really need to do to develop an application that's built in this way is define a type and then define uh, the ways in which other types can be combined together. And that would be called a co-algebra. So uh, an example of sort of how this would work comes from recursion schemes. And it's also the example that we got to work in our own, in our own project. So uh, a recursion scheme is a way of abstracting over recursive operations such that given certain responses in a recursive step, we have the ability to either kick off other operations, wait for them, and sort of treat the actual operation itself as a first class object. Real world example here is that if I were to define a value, like some statically defined value, as the return of a method, or rather as a call of a method that made several API calls, I could still reference uh, through specifically actually map or reduce operations the results of that API call without actually having to have the API call back. So like it, it literally creates almost like this placeholder in your living code base that allows us to check the validity of what we've written, you know, from, from a type theoretic perspective while also making sure that we can declare these things in, in a lazy way, which gets around issues we have with states and material programming, which is a, is a real issue um, in distributed systems. So the constellation problem, which we actually tried to solve, was a bit more complex than just trying to create a blockchain. We had some, uh, unfortunately, we lost that gift there too. Uh, but we had a couple of other things we wanted to solve at the same time. So in, in one case, we wanted to create a horizontally scalable protocol, which means that the more nodes that join, the faster it, it Comes. This is something that's not necessarily new. There's some other protocols like that. However, the way in which we wanted to, to build that was, you know, one way we wanted to solve this high-level interface problem. We also wanted to figure out a way to determine a actually fair way of federating responsibilities across the network because a lot of the DAG protocols out there right now rely upon either centralized orchestration from some type of a trusted node, which kind of defeats the purpose, or they rely on something called proof of stake, which also has the same kind of approach where people who own the largest sort of share of all the tokens in your network can basically just rewrite history. 
So I, I could go into some of the split from the uh, industry perspective there, but we've taken an approach that some of the people have as well um, in order to actually create like a democratically um, orchestrated uh, consensus or federation mechanism. And that in itself uh, really required us to make sure that we had a space of data that we could operate on. We could train, develop some type of model uh, that could then operate based upon actual behavior and, and user behavior that was logged by the protocol. So the end result here that we know that we were able to achieve was something akin to a scale-free network. So certain nodes, based upon their actual size and what they could perform, would be responsible for larger amounts of orchestration of federation, and the converse is sort of true throughout the network. And uh, I think the key thing I, that I should mention also as well that uh, was a part of uh, the problem we were trying to solve was getting nodes of different sizes in order to effectively interact with the network. The reason why we want that is because in the sort of IoT and edge computing space, which is a really big overlap with, with this tool, we want to make sure that there's a end-to-end -end verification of where every event comes from and what device it came from. Because that allows us to actually log the efficacy of our sort of IoT or sensor systems directly from the device itself, which is a huge use case I can talk to that I've uh, been doing some work on as well. And, um, you know, I think it makes sense. You want to figure out if, if you have a sensor network that's going down. So, um, also before I switch to the next slide, uh, take a look at the notation here. I've called each sort of rank or level inside of this this graph here at pi, and that represents something called uh, a rank, which we'll notice in the the model that you'll see down here. So this is this is a really you know this is like the last thing um, in like the, the mathy part of the paper. So don't don't get you know sort of out there, but um, I just wanted to break down sort of what do these things mean and how does this actual like analytical model um, sort of make sense from a, from just an intuitive perspective and how when we're actually just thinking uh, about certain systems like this, we can sort of draw them on paper and then after just having them you know in our heads on paper, have a direct course of implementation that we can translate that directly into functional code. So what we see here on the left is sort of like the signature of, of what we call like a chain complex. Or in this case, this is something uh, called a Poincaré complex, uh, in which case it actually describes a differential manifold, which has certain properties uh, which we don't need to go into here. But if you really wanted them, we got them. So the omega here represents our parent type, or sort of like that drink in our type hierarchy. The T represents the topology that you saw on the last slide and the relationship from nodes to other nodes uh, based upon some type of uh, extra geometric aspect. And then this gamma right here represents the actual space of the data that's stored within each block that, that we looked at inside of the graph. And the end goal here is that we wanted to find uh, a concurrent way to merge together data of similar relative types into a big picture and, and have that directly translate into you know, pure function or functional code. And, and the way we did that, at least in the analytical case, was we pulled out a really fun thing that computer scientists love to use called a sheaf, which represents topological data from an algebraic perspective. And there's tons of work on that at NCAT Lab, if you guys have ever been there and uh, to go over it. And so here's another uh, real world use case using a couple of uh, you know, actual tools that are out there right now. One is a very successful side channel mechanism called Lightning, which is a separate network that exists around Bitcoin in order to improve the rate at which transactions are accepted and minimize transaction fees. That would correspond to a rank to uh, protocol topology here, which represents the fact that there's just a separate rank of a child type associated with the Bitcoin block that then gets fed into the Bitcoin protocol. And then if you have something more complicated, like the sharding scheme in a project called Zilliga, that will correspond to a increasing rank uh, over, over just integers itself. So if you have multiple different layers of like sharding and, and that kind of approach, something even in a database you know, to, to extract out from there, then that would be described as this kind of a model. And so the, the goal here would really just to be, I can define my type, I can define a bunker, and I can rest assured that as long as uh, the type, you know, parent-child relationship laws are cool, and you know this thing compiles, that I have this model that I have uh, designed on paper. And then the other aspect, which is sort of like the uh, actual like space of the data itself, is uh, it was something that was constructed around this sort of this ring space, which sounds more fancy than it is. It's basically just what you get if you did a reduce by key under a combine operation for each one of these different uh, nodes. I'm not going to get into it, but you could unify, add, or maybe a tensor operation in terms of something called combine if each one of your sheets was actually written in code as a monoid, but I'm not going to go into that. But 
I do have some, uh, some actual examples I could show. And so the end result here is if we're looking at a streaming pipeline, like something, let's say, that comes directly from sensor networks and then eventually gets merged in with other uh, you know, networks out there, then we, needed, we could really um, improve our, or, uh, our modeling of how do we get all of, not necessarily improve our modeling, but improve the operation as to how could we construct this entire space that we would need, uh, at least in our in constellation uh, case, to uh, perform some type of like a reputation score. So this would actually be the kind of operation we need to do in the case where we would be explicitly calculating these, uh, these reputation scores. So the end goal here is really actually also that it preserves topological relationships and your data. So I just have a couple takeaways here, which is that uh, I think this is really cool. The API uh, you know, call graphs, or just it calls in general call graphs, can be mapped over using recursion schemes. There's a lot of fun things that will improve your code bases if you're trying to build performance systems there. Um, your types alone can verify your distributed systems. Um, these things also can be modeled with algebraic models, just litanies of uh, uh, approaches or other uh, evidence there, uh, and things you can pick and choose. Uh, as well as the fact that these models are really great for ensuring the robustness uh, and, and validity of your topological data passing through a distributed system. So that touches on even uh, another really big use case for this, which is maintaining data integrity for machine learning pipelines that are dealing with like the computer vision space. Um, that's something I could you know pop into my uh, talk about a little later too. It's a bit off topic specifically with blockchain stuff, but worth noting all the so that was a bit of a rundown uh, of like how we were able to you know build this model out of solving these problems and uh, how maybe you could you know use this in order to verify uh, and, and model out the expected behavior of your distributed system uh, and translate that directly into code with uh, these assurances that are given to you um, by that sort of category theoretic correspondence known as the Curry Howard isomorph. So yeah, that's the overview, and uh, thank you guys for for uh, listening.